60 years ago, an extraordinary national festival captured the imagination of the country. You saw the future. You saw the future. Oh, impression was, you know, this is a, a wonderful place. The place was alive with uh, excitement and promise. The 1951 Festival of Britain was a celebration designed to show how a country battered by war, debt and austerity could carve out a new future through science, design and innovation, while still having fun. Festival Britain was a very nice thing to do, to just get the people together and be happy. It, it was a very happy place, beautiful atmosphere. This was a completely radical new vision of what Britain could look like. We thought we were making something new, and indeed we were. We were building the future. It was a new beginning, absolutely new beginning. Told by the people who made it happen, this is the story of how one summer and one extraordinary festival changed Britain forever. On May 7th, 1945, there came at last an end to the war, which for almost six harsh years had conditioned the lives and the aims of the British people. The British joined in a wild celebration of victory. But as the lights went on once more, the British soberly realized that if one struggle was ended, another was just beginning. Britain had spent all its resources on this sort of great crusade to beat Nazism. So for people in Britain, they've been living through not just the Great Depression of the 1930s and the Second World War, but they've just lived through six years of kind of drab, bombed out, exhausted, financially bankrupt Britain. It was harsh. It was kind of bleak. It was a bleak atmosphere. But Compared to the Air Force, it was most charming, really. <laughs> well, it was still grey and miserable. I remember all the stone buildings were black in those days because we all had coal fires. Uh, there hadn't been any building worth the damn for the last six years or more. There were still bomb holes all over the place. London was full of bomb sites with wildflowers growing all over it, everywhere. It was shabby, shabby, um, broken, uh, um, patched up, really, most of it. And it was colourless, colourless, shabby, dull. The colours were grey and the colours were camouflage colours. Really. No buildings had been painted externally for ten years, I suppose. It was really depressing, but one just got used to it. I think anyone coming from abroad was astonished how gloomy and run down it all was. About that time, they had the great freeze where the snow came down and didn't go away. Austerity now had quite a new meaning. And for hundreds of thousands of people, the effort to keep warm was priority number one. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the whole of the country was still subject to stringent rationing. Rationing was actually, in some cases, worse after the war than it had been during the war. We'd had bread rationing, potato rationing after the war. In 1950, a working adult was allowed seven ounces of butter or margarine, one egg, half a pound of sugar, 10 pence worth of meat, two rashers of bacon, and two ounces of tea a week. Yeah, it was all rationed. Tea was rationed, butter was rationed, milk was rationed, bread was rationed. I can't think what wasn't rationed, actually. What's much more serious is the cut in the meat ration, which was already pretty small. 
It remains to be seen whether this negative policy will get results or have the old standards gone forever. I can remember coming in from work one evening and Mum said, I've got some meat and it's whale meat. And I thought, ooh, you know, flipping out. I remember whale meat vividly. It was indescribably revolting. It was blobs of this gelatinous material which had a, a very ominous shine to it. And it was this very worrying sort of grey colour. It was ghastly. It tasted even worse than it looked. Sweets were rationed. Sweets were on coupons. So you didn't get a lot of sweets. And I can also remember eating a lemon. And it was sharp as anything, but it was the first thing I had after the war. It was a lemon. <laughs> Did you know what lemon was? No. No, I knew it was sour. Six years on from the end of the war, people felt that things had not really changed, that they would, in fact, rationing had got worse, things seemed terribly grey and dreary and threadbare and tired. And I think that's why the festival really struck a chord, because it represented a sort of escapism and a welcome dash of colour in what was hitherto a very kind of grey, you know, a grey scene. <laughs> The 1951 Festival of Britain was originally planned to commemorate the centenary of the Great Exhibition of 1851. But as nobody knew what we could afford or what it should contain, a committee led by former newspaper editor Gerald Barry was set up to design and build the event. He was a man of enormous energy and, uh, and commitment. He really believed in modernism. He really believed in planning but he knew what the possibilities were. So it was his vision, really, that was created on the South Bank. And Barry's, in my view, Barry's great achievement was not simply as a, as a leader and innovator, but he had the talent to put around him a team of young people who were equally adventurous. He was not afraid of employing the younger generation of talents and letting them have their head. Charles Pluvier worked in the main office. On my floor, I was in the office next to the director of exhibitions. I had Hugh Casson just across the passage and Laurie Lee in the next office down the passage. You met a lot of interesting people and they were all youngish and keen. I mean, we thought we were making something new and indeed we were. It was terrific fun. Coming down from university, it was like being let into an enormous toy shop. You had this huge organisation to play with, and there were things going on, exciting things going on. I mean, I knew it was quite exciting because in the contracts department, I'd had to complete a contract for a life-size unicorn. So it was that sort of a place. But the first problem was to find a site. There were few accessible places in London which could house an exhibition of this size. After much wrangling, the choice fell on a badly bombed industrial area on the south bank of the River Thames. It's now been decided to hold a Festival of Britain in 1951, and the site has been selected on the south bank of the Thames. This is a very blitzed area, and quite apart from the exhibition, it's proposed to make the south side of the river here as imposing as the opposite bank. It was a dying area. It was a mess. There was nothing there except wasteland. It was industrial wasteland that we cleared and turned into this fantasy land. Although final plans are not yet complete, you can get an idea from this sketch of what London's Festival City of 1951 will look like. Permanent features are to be a concert hall and eventually a national theatre in what is described as London's culture centre. The South Bank was to be the centrepiece designed to boost morale and enrich the British way of life. It was a genuine attempt to show the brighter side of what we could do after the war and to show ourselves, really, what we were capable of, I think. 
and, and of course, the, a chance for architects and designers to show what they could do in the way of building and design. It was the first real showcase they had. It was a new beginning, absolutely new beginning. Clifford Hatz had recently graduated from the Royal College of Art. We weren't interested in what was behind us. We were only interested in what was in the front. And it, it was... Um, everybody was given the chance to use their skills in, in a new and interesting way. There was nothing, in a sense, old hat about it. Everything was brand new. It was a brave new world, in fact. The young festival designers and architects were radical. They wanted to bring the best ideas of European modernism to Britain. We were modern, yes. <laughs> we wanted to bring the new to England. We felt that the influence of the environment and of buildings on people was huge and that if it were changed, people would have a much happier life. So we, we felt this was an opportunity to show what the future might be like. And we were building the future. It was new, it was different and experimental. And, you know, it was brave. You know, it was just a shot in the arm. It was really like waking up from a deep sleep. But in 1950, not everyone supported the idea of a festival of Britain. It was hated by the Daily Express. And the Daily Express in those days was a bit like the sun today. It had an enormous circulation. It was the leading mass newspaper in the country. And Beaverbrook was hated the festival. And he was a close chum of Churchill's, and he hated it too. And in a time of great austerity, could the country really afford it? The key thing, of course, was that Britain was financially in terrible trouble in the late 1940s. We'd have to have this loan from America, we'd have to devalue the pound. There was a sense that the kind of coffers were bare. And a lot of people complained, um, particularly on the right, that the festival was this kind of great state sponsored jamboree at a time when we couldn't afford it. Tax was running at 906 of the pound on the very high income groups at the time, so uh, they just didn't like the idea. There was quite a lot of serious complaint people saying, well, you know, you shouldn't be doing this as a war on a career. But despite the war on a career, despite the rationing, despite the sweet ration, despite the clothing, the festival had to happen to sustain the spirit of the future, to sustain the look ahead to turn our backs on the past. It was a must, it had to happen. Building the future was not without its problems. At the site, management and unions were frequently at loggerheads. One of the reasons why the management was so bad is that they were mostly ex-military. They had spent six years saying, do that, and someone did it. Their management style was military discipline. By the same token, those who had been the foot soldiers resented that. There was tension all the time. I mean, there were stoppages every other day. There was this famous phrase throughout the festival that everybody had a great time and a half. I mean, it, it, the money was, it was, it was being soaked up, and the strikes were very frequent. And that was not the only problem. The rain fell and fell and fell. The weather was a real problem, the weather was ghastly. But the combination of one of the wettest winters that we'd ever known, um, plus the tensions between management and labour, it was a miracle the festival actually took place when it was supposed to take place. This was to be a festival of Britain for the whole of Britain. On May the 3rd, 1951, the King launched two days of opening celebrations at St Paul's Cathedral. This festival of Britain has been planned as a visible sign of national achievement and confidence. I declare the festival of Britain open and wish it a universal success.
That evening, a new concert hall, the Royal Festival Hall, was opened by the king. Jean Simons, who had worked on the site, was a special guest. Oh, it was sensational. I mean, I personally had never seen anything like it that I could remember. The royal family were ushered up in the goods lift to get up to the ceremonial box. And we and other dignitaries went up in another lift. And after it had gone a few feet, it stuck because um, it was overloaded. Jean found herself trapped with the festival director, Gerald Barry, chairman of the council, General Ismay, and the Lord Mayor of London, his wife, and his mace bearer. Ultimately, the Lord Mayor was saying, well, they won't be able to start with you, without you, Gerald, and you know, we'll all have to be there. And at this particular point in time, I said, well, I think I can hear the national anthem. And after a little while, they did believe that there were some people missing. And they put, I think it was one of Robin Day's chairs from the restaurant down into the lift, and we all got out. I've still got the programme and my ticket untorn because no one tore it. And it probably is one of the few remaining uh, tickets to the opening night of Festival Hall. That night, work continued feverishly to get the South Bank exhibition site ready for its formal opening next morning. We were all there the night before, working all through the night, because we wanted to get everything spick and span. You couldn't leave it. We'd been at it for two years, and you know, we was, you could not you you could not walk away from it. And then suddenly, the cleaners came in, the commercial cleaners came in with all their overs, and we were pushed out with their brooms, so to speak. You know, the women came along and said, get out, get out, get out. Five o'clock in the morning. And by that time, it was wet. And all those designers, all those great and the good designers, all the knights and the Misha Blacks and the Hugh Cassons, on this damp, miserable, wet dawn, were standing on the steps, <laughs> now raincoats, collars turned up. Half of them in tears, practically, because we were thrown out. There was nothing we could do. None of us were invited to the opening at all. None of the architects and designers. We were, hadn't been to bed, unshaven and so on. And we watched the uh, opening ceremony through a hedge, as I remember it. I found a viewpoint in the dry, clutching my little 9.5 cine camera, which I had two minutes of film, under the dome of the Discovery, and filmed what I could see, which was most, mostly, mostly rain. Another page in British history, one of the cleverest ideas that ever planned in the history of Great Britain. We shall be singing Britain forever, to it everywhere, for you are welcome to the festival that is from the British USA. For more than two years, I understand the government been making preparation. They have succeeded, I have been told, by building the largest concert hall in the world. And for the visitors' use, of course, they have erected a bridge leading to Charing Cross. They have also completed beautifully the dawn of discovery. We shall be singing, Great and forever, through it everywhere. For you are welcome to the festival that is what the British are saying. Government really done their best. 
I am sure the event will be a success. And we must thank Mr. Morrison for his amazing admonition. And after these numerous activities, we expect to have colors in quantities. It will help the financial situation in this country of Great Britain. We shall be singing Britain forever, through in everywhere. For you're welcome to the festival, that is what the British shall say. Now you saw the future. You saw the future. It was like walking into a, an outer space city, really. You were seeing something that, that had never been experienced before. And I have never encountered anyone who experienced a festival who came away without anything except a huge feeling of excitement. The place was alive with uh, excitement and promise. And to go inside the dome was like entering a great sparkling a celebration of the British way of life, in a way. It was wonderful. How to show the essence of Britain? Here, beneath the dome of discovery, vast as a city square, appears the story of the great researches, of man's probing into mysteries, of his revelations of the hidden worlds, his mastery of unknown things, his harnessing of secret forces. There was a science section, there was an outer space section, there was, a, there was a, a, an exploration section, all to do with British achievements in discovery, Dome of Discovery. And our job was to celebrate the achievements of the great British scientists. This is Newton, this is what he did. The centre of the display that I did was a celebration of Frank Whittle's invention of the jet engine in the 1930s, and that was our centerpiece. So it really went from the 17th century right up to modern times. In the early 1950s, Britain was truly at the cutting edge of technology in electronics, aviation, and atomic energy. And the most striking symbol of Britain's engineering prowess was the Skylon. A towering 300-foot-tall structure of steel and aluminium. At the time, of course, most people had never seen these kind of modernist designs. The skyline, you know, floating there in the sky. That seemed to be the space age, the new atomic age. This was a completely radical new vision of what Britain could look like. It was like a rocket. It just soared away up into the heavens. And it seemed to quiver ever so slightly with the wind. It, it, it was almost alive. It was extraordinary. James Gowan is one of the last surviving members of the design team that built the Skylon. He's one of Britain's leading architects. But the original concept was nothing like the structure that was eventually built. Hidalgo Moyer's first idea was a cigar-shaped horizontal. It was going to be filled with helium, and that was apparently terribly expensive and it would move about in the wind like a balloon. It was never really going to work because you needed a big beefy thing to get the lift, not a little slender thing. You needed a big beefy thing. And Maya came up with this other idea, the one that was developed. It was an astonishing and elegant example of British engineering. The joke was, like Britain's economy, it had no visible means of support. I remember um, people wandering around the skyline, saying, well, it can't, it can't be. There must be, you know, there must be something that we're not seeing. How does it stand up? How does it remain rigid? Um, so there was a sort of amazement of that. Oh, I, I think one, one knew it was going to be striking. 
but in fact the scale comes into it and all the guy ropes and the huge cables become much lighter in fact they disappear it was very uplifting and it did dovetail into this notion of a brave new world I think the Festival of Britain looks like a signpost of the 60s with its modernist look and the skyline and the dome and its interest in science and the space age. Those things are big themes of the 1960s. So I think the festival is of its time, but it's also ahead of its time in other ways. The festival was certainly modern and innovative. The telecinema showed films in 3D with stereophonic sound. The toilets had soft toilet paper, the first time it had been introduced to the public in Britain. There were outdoor cafes. And in the evenings, something special. I remember as a teenager, you know, you went dancing. Oh, I like dancing, cinema, boys, of course. The first time I knew about the Festival of Britain, a friend of mine said, there's open air dancing at the festival. Will you come? It was crowded of people, lots of people, and some boys behind us, young men, and uh, we started talking to them and one thing and another. It was a, you know, really nice atmosphere. Everyone was happy. We danced till it finished. had a sort of fairy tale look. And there were the whole place was lit up and illuminated. And one has to remember, not long before, we'd been living in darkness. We'd been living in the blackout. The architects had put little pea lights for the first time ever into concrete. You've never seen that before in your life. And we would dance. And if it was wet, we'd put our raincoats on. With everything illuminated and all the things moving and colour everywhere and the dome sparkling away. It was really lovely night, you know, really. Remember that night, it was a very, very nice night. I think it was a happy time with, you know, relief from the war and it was a nice thing they'd done. It was quite new and liberating. It was so exciting. One was feeling one was living again. There was something more to life than just existing. Dancing in the evening. How about that? We enjoyed that. The chief impact of the festival for me, and I think for a lot of my contemporaries, was this this feeling of openness, feeling of space. In 1951, Barry Turner was 13 years old. He was just one of the eight and a half million people who visited the festival that summer. People my age, we were brought up in an authoritarian regime. We were directed to do things, do this, do that, don't cross there, don't do that, walk in line. Q here, Q here, yes. There was, always a, there was always a retired sergeant outside the cinema saying, Q there, everybody in line, you know, good for pit back. In the festival, you didn't feel any of that at all. You could go anywhere. You could just walk. And there was this, this feeling of, of openness. If I use the word liberation, it may sound like I'm exaggerating. Not an exaggeration at all. There was a liberating feel about it. 
but it was in architecture and design that the Festival of Britain made its biggest impact. The Festival of Britain really mattered to British design history because it was that moment of an explosion of real joy and pleasure in design after the Second World War. The Festival of Britain was an attempt with this tonic to the nation to bring design and day-to-day -day life back into full living colour. The designs and the look of it was terribly exciting because it was so novel. Because, of course, they lived at the time in a world, you know, they didn't have televisions, most people. Uh, they, they weren't sort of open to the great flood of images that we have now in 21st century culture. So the festival, it was like opening a door into another world, I think, for a lot of people. And that's one of the reasons why it was so influential in terms of design in the years that followed. The Homes and Gardens Pavilion attracted people for a pretty obvious reason. Most people's homes at the time were pretty dowdy. Most people in Britain had very little furniture. And to see all these wonderful new things, including designs by Robin and Lucien Day, it's the first time we've ever seen things like this for most people. I thought, I just want that. I want a home like that. Light, clean, easy to use, and a pleasure to look at. The festival does give people a sense of taste, if you like. It defines, this is style. This is what style is going to be in the 1950s and 1960s. This is what you have to aspire to. In some ways, that, that's the ancestor of today's very materialistic, very consumer-driven, keeping up with the Joneses society. But of course, at the time, that kind of world seemed terribly liberating to people who felt that they had been shoved into kind of conformity for the last you know, decade or so. And there were whole other areas where the Festival of Britain made a lasting impression on British culture. I was very musical because my father had seven brothers and all of them were musicians. Sterling Betancourt grew up in Trinidad. In the late 1940s, there were intense conflicts and rivalries between local steel bands on the island. They used to have stoned the police. They used to be stoning them and the police have to down the hill, they have, they have to run. So they used to leave those people on the hills alone to, to play their part on, on the street without permission. To calm the situation and unite the musicians, it was decided to send one band from the whole of Trinidad, the Trinidad All Steel Percussion Orchestra, to the Festival of Britain. We knew nothing about the Festival of Britain, and it's only that you know, they, they say, well, we're going to the Festival of Britain, and we say, OK. But then they said, well, listen, we're going to collect money from the people of Trinidad, and everyone donated, and they call it Operation Britain. We, we went on, on a banana boat, actually, called the, the San Mateo. I mean, imagine you're coming from a small island, you know, you haven't got traffic like you haven't got anything, you know, and you, you see these red buses, you know, going all over the place, you know. They take you here and they take you there and they take My God, how am I going to find my way around this place? You know, it's so enormous. Oh, impression was, you know, this is a, a wonderful place. At 
nights when you have nothing to do. You can take a walk down Shapri Avenue. There you will laugh and talk and enjoy the breeze and admire the beautiful scenery of London. This is, is at the festival hall, and uh, you see the, the people there, they're standing around. This is Nathaniel Griffith, the, the band master. Um, this one is me here. Well, that day, it was very funny because we purposely did not paint the drums. They leave it all rusty and we're looking like dustbin, you know. And, and we, we, we set up and, you know, and, and, and people start to laugh, you know. They, they giggling. <laughs> what these black men going to do with these old dustmen? <laughs> When we start up, everybody was shocked. They, they were looking to see where the music coming from and saying, wow, this is black magic. And, and we had the, the West Indians who were there. They were, they were dancing, and it was very nice. And when we finish playing, they want to know where the music coming from. Have they got a recording below there or, or something like, like that? And it, it was fantastic. You can see it's young and, and old and, and, and they were clapping and, you know, we, we got a good reception. It, it was very nice. How much steel pan music had been heard in Britain before you came? None, none. Nobody ne never knew nothing ab about steel band. No, no, they didn't know anything ab ab about that. That really op opened out the, the, the art form of, of colored people and in, in, in Britain. So it, it was worthwhile, the, 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 the festival. And I hear they have it every hundred years, huh? 60 years ago, I want the whole world to know in 1951, for the Festival of Britain, the Steel Band Association said a Steel Band must go. After many suggestions, the name a Steel Band Taspo. So Trinidad, all steel, percussion orchestra, that is the song that made me remember. I said Trinidad, all steel, Percussion orchestra, that is the song that remains forever and ever. Away from the South Bank, a living exhibition of architecture was established in Poplar, a part of East London that had been heavily bombed in the war. They're building in Poplar to replace the nearly 10,000 homes destroyed in the Blitz. In the Lansbury neighbourhood, a self-contained community is rising that will feature in the Festival of Britain live architecture exhibition. Complete villages will be built with blocks of flats, houses, schools, shopping centres, markets, pubs and parks. The work's going ahead fast. I used to pass it on the bus. They had flags up and I used to look out on these flats right on the front that had been built specially for the festival and I used to look at and think oh well, they were so nice plus they was all new and I just liked them and thought you know they were nice. The exhibition was to demonstrate how practical modern architecture on a human scale could help build strong and viable communities. In many ways the most interesting bit of the festival I think is not what the big stuff on the South Bank that everybody remembers but it's what happens at the Poplar Estate, which is going to be a kind of laboratory of a new way of living. Here you have an outpost of the New Jerusalem, built from the ashes of this kind of battered old world. That battered old world was all too real for Betty Scott. In 1951, she was living in North London with her husband, mother and two children in three small rooms conditions were very basic. We just had a little black stove, I don't know what you called them, and a kettle or, or a pail or a bath put on it, 
and the bath was uh, the old tin bath that uh, you put in by the fire. The kitchens are cramped and dark and have to serve as laundry and bathroom too, with tin baths that have to be filled and emptied by hand. And your feet hang outside and then you put the rest of yourself in. <laughs> and now Francis Noel Baker interviews one of the inhabitants. Do you live here, Mrs. Kirk? Yes. What's the house like? Well, it's in a bad way. Once it's uh, pulling down and pulling up again. Are you hoping to move sometime? Well, I hope so. When do you think it'll be? God knows. I don't know. Uh -huh. All we get is promises, that's all. Don't get nothing else. The toilet was down on the ground floor. There was a toilet in the basement, but the ground floor did for the first floor, second floor and the third floor. Yeah, six of us. Six of us, because the two old ladies lived in the basement. Betty's family were among the first tenants into the Lansbury estate. Up this new Lansbury neighbourhood, which will be a complete little town when ready, welcomes the first tenant. Well, it was brand new, and in it had got a smashing bathroom and basin and a toilet all on its own and hot water. Ooh, lovely, you know. To be able to put your whole body in, in a bath, you imagine it, and, and um, you didn't have to carry all the water and, and that. Three flights of stairs from the basement. Got a garden, fantastic, for the two kids. And, and it was so spacious, you know. It was just marvellous. After you'd lived in two or three rooms, all, all the lot of you, you know, you've got plenty of room, sort of thing. Fantastic. The idea was to shape an ideal London village of the future, with shops, markets, schools, churches, pubs, there's a pub called the Festival. It was a real piece of England, a real piece of London. This was something that I think the planners behind the festival poured an enormous amount of energy into. They, they saw this in many ways, I think, as the sort of the crowning point of the festival. This was the new Britain. We were geared to the idea that we could make life better for people and almost all the planning philosophers of the time were like that. They really believed they could plan people into better ways of life and to some extent they succeeded. In time, there'll be neighbourhoods like Lansbury. It's the dawn of a new era for London's East End. We all came from different parts of London. And it was marvellous. We all got on so famously together, I'm not kidding. And we always laughed and chatted to the people next door. I'm not kidding, got on real famously, didn't matter who you were and that. At the time, the Lansbury Estate was the largest collection of modernist buildings in Britain. The Lansbury Estate was like a city village built in a gentle, relaxed, modern style. It was innovative, it was friendly, it was charming, but it couldn't and didn't meet the demand for new housing in London or in other British cities. And what replaced it very soon afterwards was the great, infamous concrete estates with a high density, massive towers, brutal concrete. But I think since then we've started to look back a little and started to think architecture, city planning needs a bit of joy in it. You know, cities should be enjoyable and the Festival of Britain did show how that was possible. But not all of the festival activities in London were geared to education and progress. Up the river in Battersea, the festival pleasure gardens had one sole purpose, fun. I think the festival represented to most people a kind of escapism. It was a fantastic day out, basically. I mean, that's what most people wanted. They wanted a day out, they wanted a chance to celebrate Britain, a chance to feel good about themselves, and a chance particularly to feel good about their future, to look at the Britain that was coming. And the festival offered all those things to, be, to people. In September 1951, the Gowland family from Croydon in Surrey set out on a visit to the Festival Pleasure Gardens in Battersea. Well, we went by car because my, my father didn't really understand trains and he never used them, he could possibly avoid it. So the five of us went in the Rover. 
in those days there was so little traffic on the road that a journey from Croydon to Battersea would have been nothing. Their day out was recorded on colour film by their father, Geoffrey Gowland. It was fun, it was colourful, it was bright, it was different. And everybody did seem very happy there. It was a complete yeah. sort of antidote to the austere world in which we had grown up. If you look at the cine films of it, almost everyone's walking around with a silly grin on their face. It, it was a very happy place, beautiful atmosphere. It was like a boardwalk effect that it ran on. It made a tremendous noise. Well, that was good fun. It seemed to be going at tremendous speed, but of course it wasn't. Entertainments like that had almost died out. There was very little of it during the war years and the years immediately afterwards. Everybody loved the Emmett Railway. I certainly remember the Emmett Railway. That's my main yeah. memory of the Battersea Pleasure Gardens. Emmett was very popular. He was a cartoonist who um, produced these wonderfully detailed pictures of um, decrepit old engines, and we all loved them. They were very, very popular. If you ask a dozen people who went to Battersea, probably at least ten of them would name that as their favourite thing. Things like the railway at Battersea do look very whimsical and almost a little bit silly, but I think those are very important because they, they A, testify to a kind of deep love of comedy and silliness in our national character, and secondly, I think they come out of something very important, which is that in the war, in the Second World War, um, celebrating British whimsy and a British sense of humour and a kind of native silliness had been very important. I, people had picked on that and they'd said, that's something that differentiates us from the Nazis. You know, the Nazis think they're terribly serious with their jackboots and their silly marches and their stupid rallies and whatnot. We just like sitting around with pipes and eating cakes and having fun. And I think the festival is kind of celebrating that. It is saying we are an introverted, domesticated, slightly frivolous people. And that's what makes us special. And we should be proud of that and not deny it. Battersea was the perfect antidote to the grey days of the preceding decade. It was a lovely atmosphere. It was a very happy time for everybody there. And you came away from it feeling energised and um, at peace with the world. It was, it was lovely. Never forget it. Jean Blurton was 19 years old when she met Tommy Miller for the first time. He sort of took to me and that was it. Didn't think we'd ever see each other anymore. But he asked me then um, to go out with him the following week to the fun fair that the festival would put on. And that's when we went to Battersea. I had a wonderful time there, it was lovely. We went on the um, caterpillar that closes over and that's when he kissed me in the caterpillar. <laughs> we were young, innocent. So it all began. Oh, I think it was lovely. Well, it, it certainly fanned us too. Outside of London, two travelling exhibitions took the festival's vision of the future around the country. The Land Travelling Exhibition visited four cities in the heart of England over the summer of 1951. Dorrit Deck, an artist and refugee from the Nazis, 
got the job designing the sports section after meeting its director, Dick Levin. Dick asked me, have you done murals? I said, oh, yes, of course. But he was such a fool, he didn't ask to see any. Dorrit had never painted a mural before in her life. I didn't know anything about cricket and I didn't know anything about football or fishing. But when I brought him the rough for that mural, they said, fine, would you like to do the whole stand? Oh, it was hugely loved and, and visited. I think it was definitely a success. I mean, it earned its keep. The festival even took to the high seas. Visiting ten major British ports this summer is the former escort carrier Campania, with an interesting story aboard. More than 350,000 people have already passed through the turnstiles to see it, and she has not yet completed half her voyage. The story which she tells is about Britain and her people. The Navy has loaned the ship to carry the sea travel exhibition of the Festival of Britain, which on a smaller scale develops the same theme and in a similar manner to the exhibition on the south bank of the Thames. That summer, the Campania was visited by more than 800,000 people. And out of London, too, there was much to show that it was the Festival of Britain. All across the country, there were thousands of local Festival of Britain celebrations. I mean, don't forget, if you've had six years of war, six years of austerity, and you give people the chance to have a party, they will take it. And I think people all over the country genuinely seized this opportunity and got very excited about it. People did put on, you know, some of them quite silly carnivals and fates. I think because they were desperate to have the opportunity to enjoy themselves and to have a day of self-congratulation to an extent. I think that really meant something to people. But that is all the events, all the things that happened everywhere in the country in festival year, from major music and drama festivals down to bus shoulders and telephone kiosks. It's, it's the lot. It was supposed to embrace everybody's spare time and everybody's getting together and building things in their villages and holding pageants, and, and they did. And it's staggering. I've never counted them, but there were thousands. And this was a precursor of the big society. Since the Festival of Britain was declared open by the King last May, its centrepiece, the exhibition on the South Bank, has proved a big attraction to the people of Britain and to visitors from overseas. Nearly eight and a half million people had passed through the South Bank turnstiles in the five months before it closed down. Impressive figures marking the widespread interest aroused by the exhibition at home and abroad. The last hours at the South Bank included a number of ceremonies and farewells. Tens of thousands were present and the people sang. The visual closing of the Pleasure Gardens by the Lord Mayor of London, Sir Dennis Lawson, was clearly unpopular. It is now my duty to declare the Festival Gardens closed for the year 1951. <laughs> Thank you all for your wonderful cheerfulness tonight. The Battersea Gardens had undoubtedly been a great success. I cried on the way back because it was all over suddenly. All the, suddenly I was just nobody. And I think we were all very sad when it was taken down. It seemed a loss, but it did its job. I think it was it well worth every penny.
It was uh, very sad. We had hoped that we would be able to wind it up in a graceful fashion. Labour lost the election and the Tories wanted it dismantled and forgotten as quickly as possible. So they sold it up, gave it away, cleared the site of everything except the Festival Hall. There was a sense of disappointment, if not anger, because they could have let it fade away in a natural sort of way, but they got the bulldozers in. Parts of the Skylon and the Dome of Discovery ended up as souvenir paper knives. Essen said, if you cement bricks together to last for six months, they'll last for 60 years. And most of those buildings would have survived to this day, I think. I think you really can see the Festival of Britain as a turning point. I think it's a turning point from like an old kind of cramped collective Britain to a much more new and open and mobile consumerist one. Many of the sort of promises of the festival have now been realised. We do live in a world where we take art and design more seriously. We live in an age that's been transformed by science and technology. And there's a kind of scientific optimism to the festival that I think was hugely important in the second half of the 20th century. And in many ways, I think you can see the festival as a preview of all that, as completely ahead of its time and anticipating so much of what was to come. I think the, the festival did change Britain. People now are beginning to realise that the 50s was far more innovative than we gave it credit for at the time. But I think looking back now, you can see a lot of what happened in Britain in the 60s and 70s that had its origins in the Festival of Britain. But I think it's a little bit of history. I thought the Festival of Britain was a very nice thing to do, to just get the people together and be happy. And uh, that's how I remember it. It was very nice. I loved it. I had such a gorgeous time there. And I still believe in a lot of the things that it produced, I think clean lined furniture and architecture. It's a good thing and it was tremendous. It was, it was the most exciting job I've ever had. I couldn't have enjoyed it more. Uh, it was such a, an interesting innovation and it was such a great time for, for young designers that, that I look back on it with great pleasure. It was indeed enough for one lifetime, I can tell you. The wall of Britain will always be as an evergreen in your memory. The festival of Britain will always be as an evergreen in your memory. After a hundred years passed and gone, it's on again 1951. So the whole world came in to see the invincible Great Britain is standing free. So it always be an invincible.